In this video, I'm going to walk you through how to get tired landlords with vacancies as a leads list. We'll walk through how to get these listings from Zillow, how to get them into a spreadsheet, and how to pull owner information. You'll be able to have the data at your fingertips to even create charts to analyze things like price to rent ratio and more. We'll walk through how you can take one of these listings, find the property owner, and even pierce the corporate veil. By the end, you'll also be able to create an offer on one of these properties. All right, let's get started. One of the biggest pain points I hear from both newbie and experienced real estate investors is finding quality leads. Leads are effectively someone who's looking or possibly interested in selling their property. And if you can find great leads off market, you could potentially find deals under market value, so at a lower cost. If you're brand new to leads, I have a whole entire video about going through on-market and off-market leads, motivation levels for each, so feel free to check that out. But for this video, we're going to focus on actually getting some of these leads. One of the top leads I see individuals go for is the tired landlord's list. These are basically individuals who've owned a property for a period of time, and maybe they're looking to get it off their books. It could be that they're retiring or they're facing some other pain point. Now, the main problem here is that there are actually a lot of landlords. How do we actually see how many landlords there may be in a given area? So what I'm looking at right now is Real Estate API that provides property data. I'm running a quick search that's going to be only on the count of records. So instead of pulling all the data, I'm just getting a count to get a sense. So I'm filtering on Toledo, Ohio, and I'm going down to this one filter they have, Investor Buyer. So someone who's likely a landlord that purchased possibly with cash as well, or they're an absentee owner and investor. When I run this, I could see that there's over 60,000 results. Now, what happens if I wanted to go after all these 60,000? I'd probably spend over $60,000 alone just on marketing. Marketing via email, text campaigns, phone calls, that's not going to be the best use of my time. I want to filter down this list to maybe the landlords who are feeling the most pain. So what's one of the most obvious ways landlords feel pain? It's when they don't have a tenant in place. Why? Because they're losing money every single month by not having rent payment or income coming in to offset their expenses. So when it comes to tired landlords lists, why not try to pair that with individuals who have vacant properties? So that's what we're going to do in this video. Here I filtered on Toledo, Ohio for rentals and Zillow. You could find rentals on many different platforms, including Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist as well. We're going to focus on Zillow for this particular use case. Here I could see when I filter on home type, I want to just look at houses. I am going to see 250 rentals available. Now these are sorted by Zillow's algorithm. You could sort them in different ways as well. So we want to collect these properties into a spreadsheet. And in this spreadsheet, we want to be able to score how good these potential leads are before we go into getting owner information. For this exercise, we're going to walk through how to pull this data via Scrapepeak's Zillow Scraper. There's plenty of Zillow Scrapers out there. Scrapepeak is the one I suggest for this use case, as you can start off with a free plan, which should get you at least a solid list of leads. If you also want a live session with me on how to actually extract data with alternative leads lists, You can check out our live mini course running from October through November of 2024. So right now I'm on Google Collab. It's a free notebook and environment where you can run code, particularly in Python, without having to have it installed on your machine at all. Now, if you're not a programmer, that's okay. I'm going to walk through this series of steps that will be easy to interpret and understand. So the first thing we need to do is install necessary packages that will allow us to do data manipulation and visualization. So I'm going to click play here to run this particular cell of code. I have the queue in front so it can quietly install and it has within four seconds. Our next step is also a setup as well. Here, we're going to import our libraries, which I have here, request, pandas, get past, date time, and plotly. I'm also setting the option that when we do view our data in a table, we'll see all of our columns at once. Next, I'm going to detail what these functions do when we get to them. This will allow us to do repeated code actions. And now getting into the last part of setup, which is locals and constants. In order to run this for your own given city, so right now I'm going to be doing Toledo, Ohio, 
you will need to get an account with Scrapeek and you'll be entering your password here. It is free to start off with. So I'm going to first replace this URL to the Toledo listing here. It's a really long URL as a, as a warning. So here, now you want to press play and enter in your password for Scrapeek. Great. Now we can move on to actually fetching this data. So we're going to use the Zillow API to gather rental listings. I'm going to make a request to this API. So I'm sending in my API key and my listing URL. It's going to return back with the first 40 listings. We're going to use this as a sample set before doing a for loop to be able to get all the listings. So if we go to this function, we could see up here, we are simply just calling the URL entering our API key listing URL and making a request. There's more documentation if you'd like to review than the Zillow scraper. You can go and navigate towards the bottom to the API documentation. I received a response in about three seconds. I'm going to transform this to a JSON object so we could view the data that's coming back. Looks like I have keys on whether this was a successful request or not, data, message, and info. I've already sifted through this response, so I know that all the listings sit in this structure under data, cat1, search results, list results. Total, since I'm not looping through pages right now, I'm getting 41 listings. And here, if I look at one of these listings, I can view that raw data. So for one particular listing, I am getting the detail URL. So let me click that so you could see. It's for this property house for rent. It's renting for 1150, three beds, one bath, almost 1000 square feet our data, we could see that is true. The price is $1,150. We also have an unformatted price as well. We have the address, beds, baths, and area, which matches what we saw on listing site. So this is the magic of using technology, especially with web scraping tools and APIs, is you can gather this data automatically rather than having to copy it into a spreadsheet, pencil, and paper. What's interesting is that we get more information about applications, time on market, as well as home info data. We could see how long the property has been sitting on Zillow, which will help us to determine maybe the seller is more motivated because it's been sitting longer. And we can also look at values like tax assessed values and more. I'm going to print some of these fields so you could see it for this particular object. So if I index on my object X, which is for the property, I can get the ZP ID, so it's unique URL, as well as the main photo, the price, latitude, longitude, which we'll use to plot later on, Zestimate and Rent Zestimate as well. We could see it also has a field called Marketing Treatments, which says Paid and Zillow Rental Manager. So I assume that this individual is boosting the listing by using the paid version of Zillow Rental Manager, which is about $30 per listing. So we've retrieved the data. We've now looked at one of the data points, but how do we actually just filter on those fields we care about? So this is where a little bit of data manipulation comes into play. So we have all of our listings under this field, list results. So we're going to get that to a list. Now we want to iterate. So basically go through each of these records and specify what fields we want. In this case, I don't want all the fields. I just want a couple that I could build some features on, like price, Zestimate, days on Zillow, as well as availability date. So I'm going to run this, and it's going to go through each of these listings, which it did in less than a second. I'm filtering on single family, and I'm going to get these listings now into my new list. So if I transform this, it is now a data frame. Data frame is simply, think of it as a table format. So we have rows and columns. Here I'm looking at just the first two results. So we see that we have the fields that we care about, ZPID, price, address, beds, bath, area, square footage, and more. Which technically we could stop here, right? And we could just throw this into our CRM. But that's not going to be as effective. We want to know how good these particular leads are. So what we're going to do is do a little bit more analysis to understand the makeup of our data. Here I'm going to run a group by so I could see for my sample set of 40 records, what is the count by bedrooms? So it looks like most of these properties have three bedrooms and the list price on average is $12.72 for these. Looks like there's a big jump from one bedroom to two bedroom and a slight increase from two bedroom to three bedroom by about $100.
Now I can create additional features. Some things I might care about is price per square foot. What does that look like in the area? Rent to price ratio. This is a really simple metric to try to get out. Will the property cash flow or not? You look at price as well as the estimate of the property of how much it would be to acquire it. And we can also look at the 1% rule, another really quick metric to see how many of these properties might cash flow. So I'm running these features and now I have three additional columns, price per square foot, rent to price ratio, and the 1% rule. It looks like a lot of these properties do meet the 1% rule. And if I just kind of glance over here, like this first property, this estimate is almost 70,000 and then the price is 1150. This is one of the reasons why Toledo, Ohio is a market that a lot of people love, particularly for the jobs aspect, but also because there's a lot of cash flowing properties. And of course, please note, Zestimate isn't always perfect. If you're deciding, do I use Zestimate as my estimate or not? You can go particularly to Zillow's site where they talk about Zestimate and they even break down accuracy based on top metro area states and national. So you can get a better picture if for your market, Zestimate is an accurate measure or not. Now that we have our data with some additional features, we can start to visualize these characteristics. Here I'm going to use Plotly Express to do so. It's a really easy way to be able to plot information on our table. So here we're going to start off with the distribution of beds. So we saw here previously that most of the properties are three bedrooms and they're around $12.72 for price. Here we could also see that reflected in a visual format where we have on our x-axis bedrooms, so one, two, three, and four. And then we see on our y-axis the average price. So there's a big step up between one bed to two bedrooms, and then a more gradual one as we go into four-bedroom territory. We could also look at the price versus the area by using a scatter plot. With Plotly Express, you can also add a trend line to help visualize patterns for the data as well. With Plotly Express, we can go back to a bar chart and look at one of our new measurements, which was price per square foot. We could see here that the number of bedrooms for two actually has a higher price per square foot than three and four, which is pretty interesting. Then we can also look at histogram to see for our 40 sampled listings, what the distribution looks like for price, which most of them a considerate of the bedrooms is around $1,100 to $1,200 for rent. One of my favorite things to do is actually visualize the data as well. And because we have latitude and longitude, we can actually visualize this using scatter map box. And here I'm looking at price. We could see most of the rentals of higher price seem to be towards this area or left-hand side of Toledo down here, as well as a little bit north of Toledo as well. This could start to help us get a sense of where higher price rentals are versus lower price as well get a feel of the neighborhoods of in Toledo. So we have now an understanding of the data. We're able to get it into a tabular format. But one of the biggest problems we have is if someone just sent us this list, which one should we even work off to start with? Which is why we're going to create another column called lead score to actually score these leads as which ones maybe have higher motivation than others. How do we do this? It's actually quite simple. For this exercise, we're just going to look at three different fields. We're going to look at days on Zillow. So how long has a property been sitting? Our assumption or our hypothesis is that properties that sit on the market longer, that are vacant for a longer period of time, have more distress for the property owners because they're losing out on money every single month. Then we're also going to look at rent to price ratio. Because ideally, we want to go after properties where we can make a profit if we were to make an offer on the property. So we're going to take these two fields and we're going to normalize them on a scale from zero to one. So we're doing that with this function here up top. And we're also going to clip if there are any outliers. So if we see something really strange where there's one property that's one bedroom, but the rental price is 8000 that will handle the normalization to not skew our algorithm. And the other thing that we're going to look at is price change. Our hypothesis, once again, if the price is changing, which is likely a drop in price, then the owner may be more motivated to rent this property because they're feeling pain, potentially even a greater factor into motivation. So what we're doing with this column that we're creating called lead score is that we're taking our three fields, two of them being normalized since they're numeric values, and I'm putting a weighting against them. Going to make this super simple 
And I'm going to say that days on Zillow, as well as potential for cash flow, are going to be my top indicators of motivation. So I'm putting them each at 40% or 0.40, and then the price change being 0.20. We could then sort our data frame by our new lead score. So here I'm going to show the first five records. And now I have my ZPIDs or my properties actually sorted by this lead score column with the number one being 0.75 and lowest in the top five being 0.63. Now, if we had a property that was the longest sitting on market, the highest with cash flow and had a price change, this lead score would be one. But in this case, we don't have a perfect trifecta of the three. Um, so we do have a score that's lower than one. But if we look at this property, at least for the first one, we could see that it does meet the 1% rule. If we drag this over, we could see this estimate is about 63000 and it rents for about 1150 It also has had a price change of about negative $200, so a drop in $200 of the rental price. And we could see it's been on market for 27 days, which 27 days isn't really that huge of a pain point. And we could also see by the market, like what's the average. But because we are just looking at the first 40 listings, it's going to pull from this initial first page, which is going to likely be sorted or have something in the algorithm that's pushing newer properties up towards the top. So if we were to get all the listings, then we'll start to see some of those with the higher pain point of longer days on market. So this is really the value of just adding a few simple features to help you generate a scoring method so that when you start to look at your leads, you're focusing on top ones first. So let's look into the second one. The second lead is for 238 Dickage Drive. I am going to copy this and open it up in Zillow. This property is three beds, one bath, 960 square feet. Now for me, that's pretty small. Uh, in terms of square footage for the number of bedrooms, it signals that the bedrooms are likely really tiny, which I don't like for my own personal investments. What I would usually do is add in my lead score, some sort of penalizer, if say the ratio of bedrooms to square feet is really small. But for this use case, we're not going to do that. We can look quickly at these photos and we could see yeah, this room looks to be really small, but overall it does look to be in pretty good shape. And I like that it has a separate garage here. Maybe that could be a conversion in the future. We could see that this has been on market for about 37 days, zero applications coming from Zillow, which is a really low uh, ratio. Usually you get at least a little bit more and it's on the first page. So that's, that's a little bit problematic. Uh, looks like it's by a management company, Glass City Rentals. And we could even see it in the photos, Glass City Rentals as well. So what if this was in our target of something that we did want to reach out to the owner about? How do we find the owner information? One of the easiest ways to find owner information is via the county. The county records are also free to browse. So if I'm looking at Toledo, Ohio, a market I'm not as familiar with, the first step I would do is go look up the city, the state, and the county because I want to get the county records. So I could see that Toledo is in Lucas County, Ohio. So my next step is searching here, Lucas County, Ohio property search. And I'm going to see here an owner search available. When I click this link, it brings me to their real estate information system, their portal. And I can search properties by owner. But that's a problem because I don't know the owner for this property. That's the whole reason why I'm going into the county records. But they have additional tabs. We could look at parcel number, assessor's number, as well as address. I'm going to click address here. And each county will format this differently. Sometimes they're more consistent within the same state. But in this case, we need to enter the street number as well as the street name. I've already done this and the results are here. So we have here 238 Dickens Drive. We can see what census tract it's in and even most importantly, who is the owner? The owner is Glass City Rentals, which does match what we saw in those photos as well as the management company that was listed in the Zillow listing. We can look at a lot more information, including the whole history of the property. But for our use case, what if we wanted to reach out to this owner? Well, unfortunately, this is an LLC, so we don't know who owns the property. We need to take an added step by piercing the veil of the LLC. So I've done that in these steps. 
So it's first going to the rental listing, second, viewing the property records, finding the owner. We see it's an LLC. In the case that it is, we need to use sites like Open Corporates, which you can use for free. And here I typed in the company name as Glass City Rentals. And it came back with Glass City Rentals Incorporated in 2018 in Ohio. Agent name is Ricky E. Howell Jr. So now I know that there's an individual behind this LLC. How do I actually find the individual? The last step here is to skip trace. You could skip trace for free using fast people search. So I entered in Ricky Howell for Toledo, Ohio, and I saw an address or related address that matches that of the agent address. And now I have the property owner with phone number and I can directly reach out to them. But this is very manual, right? Having to go through all of these steps just to find the owner for a single listing. By using Coffee Closer's quick report, we can run the numbers on any on or off market residential address. In this case, for 238 Dickens Drive, we could see the same property information, but now actually have a calculator for our investment purposes. Here we're looking at the property for turnkey buy and hold. What is the as is value, which here we've pulled from Zillow, Realtor, and Real Estate API to give us one holistic potential offer price. And we could see how our cash on cash would change based on what our asking price would be. For the seller, if we find out that their equity levels, that they fully own their property, which we'd show you if this is the case here, we could do a seller finance deal and have an automatic generated offer. So that's a bit of an idea of how you can have the entire workflow. Now, if you want to get this data into a listings to CSV, you can run this cell and it will show up on the left-hand side under your folders for the sample rental listings. Now, there's a lot of things we did not cover here. For one, data accuracy and enrichment. Having to go through manually to find the property owner and to run the numbers on given deals is really tedious. There are a ton of APIs we could use to get property history automatically, as well as owner financing information and skip tracing. These will be covered in our Alternative Leads mini-series. We'll go through live, step-by-step, how to actually gather these leads at scale and be able to append property and owner information to enrich these leads and score them so you know where to spend your time and your marketing efforts. Even if you're not looking for tired landlord leads or return to office leads, the methodologies we're going to go through and the foundation you'll be able to apply to any other real estate related leads gathering topic or idea that you may have. The foundation is the same, web scraping, skip tracing, data aggregation, and automations. And because it is live, you'll be able to ask questions to myself and Noah, who are experts within the data space and automation space, particularly for real estate. Other things we'll be covering, so automating data retrieval as well. We're not going to want to run this notebook on an everyday basis just to get new leads. We'll want to have this in a more systematic way, and we'll discuss briefly how to go over repeated workflows, for example, using things like Zapier or even going into the cloud. As well, what if we didn't want to just use Zillow rentals? There's also rental listings on Craigslist as well as on Facebook. These will require other tools like Browse AI as well as Phantom Buster for scraping social media. And then also enhanced analysis. So when it came to just looking at creating this lead score, we only looked at three different factors, but there's so many other things that would make an owner motivated to sell. Are they an absentee owner? Do they live out of state? These are all things we'll be able to get when we have the property owner information. And then we can actually build a more robust algorithm to score our leads. Now, when you do have leads, when you're getting started, you could just simply use it as a spreadsheet and reach out to folks and be able to see who's gotten back to you, who hasn't, and what are the next steps. But eventually, if you are going off market, you need CRM integration using tools like Go High Level so that you can reach out to these individuals. And because we have that added information that it's not just a tired landlord, but they have a vacancy, you can really have personalized outreach. And of course, say if you have this data running for Toledo, you have this leads workflow that goes off once a week. 
After a couple of months, you'll really gather a lot more data and you could do things like predictive modeling. You'd be able to see, okay, a listing just came on market, but based on prior data, this one's probably going to sit for 60 days by the way the photos look and the way the landlord has priced the property for its given area. You could start marketing to that lead now because your predictive model has helped you to understand that's probably going to be one of those that sits on for a long time. I hope this has been a useful video to start to think outside of the box. How do we build alternative leads lists? It's not just the same leads everyone else is going for, but we add an extra element to see motivation for a property owner. If you want to see more videos like this, then please leave comments below as well. If you want to get deep in the weeds and learn more about how to create these alternative leads lists, join us for the mini series. Thanks.